Welcome to Across Africa, our weekly look at stories from across the continent. I'm Georgia Calvin-Smith, and this week, the movie Measures of Men spotlights the first genocide of the 20th century in which tens of thousands of indigenous Nama and Herero were slaughtered by German soldiers. The film bids to confront viewers with the harsh realities of colonial violence. Also, in Morocco, fans of sand hockey are trying to raise awareness of the game's cultural heft. It has a long history called Makacha. It's part of the country's ancestral heritage, but supporters are worried that it's at risk of disappearing. And a Beninese TikTok comedian hits the right note. Axel Merrill switches genre, going from comedy to croonery, with the release of a single that's become an almost overnight hit in the French-speaking Caribbean and Francophone Africa. But first, the first genocide of the 20th century has inspired a movie by a German filmmaker exploring a dark and too often overlooked part of his country's colonial history. Between 1904 and 1908, German soldiers exterminated up to 100,000 Herero and around 10,000 Nama in what's today known as Namibia. Our correspondents went to meet the director. This is the story of the first genocide of the 20th century. The film tells the tale of a young German ethnologist studying indigenous peoples in Namibia and collecting their skulls for scientific experiments. Meanwhile, colonial troops are unleashing a massacre on the Herero and Nama peoples. Measures of Men, directed by Laus Kama, depicts the crimes of the former German colonial power. With his film, the director wants Germans to face their historical responsibility. Germany suffers from a true collective amnesia. People either don't know or pretend not to know that Germany was a colonial power. This film aims to convey this history to the general public who have not yet questioned the issue of ethnological collections and restitutions. Colonial crimes and the genocide, which took at least 70,000 lives between 1904 and 1908, remain largely unknown to the German public. In Berlin, only a commemorative plaque reminds people of the horrors of colonialism, but it was placed in a military cemetery at the foot of a monument paying tribute to colonial troops. Sad but not surprising, says Israel Konatieke, a Herero living in Berlin for over 40 years. For me, this plaque is a disgrace. The stone is big, the plaque is at the bottom. It clearly shows how this society still perceives things. In 2021, Germany officially recognized the genocide and offered over a billion euros in development aid. But for Israel Konatieke and activists for the rights of the Herero and Nama peoples, it is far from enough. We want apologies, recognition of the genocide and reparations for what we've lost, including the theft of our land. Many people are still unaware of all of this, but things are starting to change, and that's why the German government should change its current stance and say, Yes, we acknowledge international law and we will negotiate directly with the descendants of the victims. The Namibian government now wants to renegotiate the genocide agreement reached with Germany in 2021, but the government says it won't. In Niger, a local group has gone further than many authorities could in brokering peace amongst warring tribal communities. A committee in Bani Bangu has managed to broker a deal that's cut through some of the mistrust in a region often plagued by violent clashes. Our correspondents report. Umaru Sumana is a mining engineer and a peacemaker. There are five ethnic groups in the Bani Bangu region. The Zarma, the Fulani, the Hausa, the Tuareg, and the Arabs. Our rivalries were only causing more violence, so we concluded that we need an official agreement to live in peace. Fulani communities are often stigmatized in Niger, accused by some of being more likely to be linked to regional terrorist groups. Umaru and his committee speak out against dangerous and divisive stereotyping. Jihadists spread messages in the Fula language and they display Fulani people in their videos. But despite this, we know that these groups hide the involvement of other non-Fulani communities. It's a very dangerous manipulation. 
So we gathered village chiefs, some Fulani people, and respected elders. And at that moment, people realized that our violent rivalry was only helping the terrorists. The committee says that inter-ethnic conflict is the main driving force behind terrorist attacks in the region. Umaru stresses that education plays an important role in preventing violence. This is a very good initiative, and in less than three months we have seen fewer attacks than before. This is life-saving, because civilians feel involved in fighting this threat. The Peace and Development Committee is made up of civilian volunteers, and its work has been recognized by Niger's government. In light of this initial success, Sumaru Sumana and the committee members are reaching out to new funding partners. Cape Town is gearing up for the opening of the world's tallest building made of hemp. The Hemp Hotel has blocks made of the cannabis plant in its walls, along with concrete and cement. Called Hempcrete, they're carbon negative and remove more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than they put into it. Olivia Bizo tells us more. With its 12 floors, breathtaking views of Cape Town and minimal ecological footprint, this hemp hotel is set to open its doors in June. It's the world's highest building made of industrial hemp, which is part of the cannabis family of plants. In the last few years, the raw material has been making a comeback in the construction industry. They're the structures that's built out of hempcrete um, centuries ago that's still standing today. So it's almost like we, we, uh, we're going back to the basics in terms of construction methodologies but scaling it up um, and in, in combination with, with modern technology and modern plant technology. Not only is it tough, but hemp also has the potential to make big savings in carbon dioxide emissions. The plant traps carbon dioxide when cultivated and can, when made into blocks, replace concrete, which is a carbon-intensive product. The carbon reduction is massive and I think, you know, hemp is kind of like an alternative building material, but it's almost become mainstream in a way, or the way we see it. So I think that, um, you know, these are tools with which we can reduce or have an impact on climate change. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa has made developing the country's hemp and cannabis sector an economic priority, saying it could create more than 130,000 jobs. Hockey has a long history in Morocco, and today players are still being cheered on by enthusiastic fans as teams battle it out in the sands. Called Makacha, it's part of the country's ancestral heritage, but supporters are worried that it's at risk of disappearing, and they're pushing to raise greater awareness of the game. Chasing after a woolen ball, these nomads in southern Morocco are fighting to keep the game of Makacha alive. It's just like hockey but it's played on sand, with barefoot players wielding palm wood sticks. It's part of our ancestral heritage that has been passed down from father to son. We've been playing it for years. Our ancestors played this game in their spare time, when they traveled in caravans and stopped to rest. They made the ball from camel wool and the sticks from palm wood, whatever they had on hand. Nestled in Morocco's deep south, on the edge of the Sahara, Mohamed El Ghazlan used to be a stop on the Trans-Saharan caravan route to Timbuktu, a trading post for gold and salt that grew rich in the 14th and 15th centuries. Today, this oasis town in southern Morocco is still inhabited by nomadic people, but increasingly, Mokasha is losing its popularity. These players are trying to revive the game by organizing competitions and encouraging other players to join them. Other forms of sand hockey can be found in Ethiopia and Tunisia, all of them set to date back hundreds of years. 
And a rising Beninese star has successfully crossed over from one genre to another and still managed to keep his appeal. Axel Merrill had already gathered an impressive multi-million online following as a TikTok comedian and influencer. Well, he's recently released a single and music video that has boosted his popularity with fans across Francophone Africa and the French-speaking Caribbean. Our team has more. Just hours before his return to France, Axel Merrill's popularity has taken off in Cotonou. J'aime bien ses sketchs, je le trouve super drôle, il, a, il est très charismatique. C'est une fierté pour le pays actuellement. Le fait qu'il y ait plusieurs millions de filles, en fait, ça, fait, ça montre vraiment que les gens l'aiment. Quoi. Just a few days earlier, the Beninese online comedian and singer released a music video that went viral. It tracked up 2 million views in 48 hours without any promotion. The song is dedicated to the daughter of the renowned Ivorian pastor, Camille Makoso. The project has even seen Axel collaborate with the famous comedian, Michel Gaud. I'm very surprised. Everything happened so quickly, but I was kind of confident because the project was good. Axel's success is not a fluke. He's doing a master's degree in digital art and has carefully plotted his path for over a decade. I was already trying to establish myself by doing parodies. It helped me gain a certain level of recognition. It just took a small spark to make people realize that I'm also deeply passionate about music. With comedy, dance, music and films, Axel Merrill entertains his 4 million subscribers on TikTok. He says US actor Will Smith is his role model. Since the video's release, Axel can now charge up to 5,000 euros per post, tripling his market value. He strategically and effectively rallies his community around the project. As long as he continues to nurture this relationship with his community, his popularity will keep rising. The more his influence grows, the more valuable he becomes. Since his viral video, major commercial brands in Europe and Africa have shown interest in collaborations. Influencers like Axel help brands target specific audiences that traditional media struggle to reach. <laughs> well, that's it for Across Africa. Thanks for joining us. And do so again if you can. Till then, take care.